Can you do her first? Because we were supposed to do the 2.30 thing, so she here for that. Yeah. I didn't know he already queued you up. Yeah, she was the first one that we came up with that idea. Yeah. So, uh, for the people watching, I mean, originally I just wanted to re to record a video with the next speaker for the Decoder Chats blog uh, that I do for Microsoft. And uh, then they told me, like, oh, we got a live streaming thing, so you might as well do it with every speaker here. And uh, now we're doing that. So, we're going to get the recordings of this later, chop them up into pieces, and give them piecemeal the information out on the internet for everybody out there. So, hopefully, the break is over, so we won't have 10,000 people running past the camera anymore like we had before. So, Kim, yes. you gave the keynote at the first day here and people were super excited. I just walked in from the flight completely tired and I saw the energy that you were extruding on stage. And I was like, this was cool. <laughs> this is the kind of speaker that I want to see. So you talked about mentoring yes. uh, mostly. So um, is it a good thing? No. Uh, <laughs> so um, what do you think about uh, is the... Mentoring to me is, is a very personal thing and it's a very it used to be a very rare thing mm -hmm. But it seems like there's a whole market now or a whole movement in our market that realizes the benefits of having a mentor Structure inside your own company and also getting external mentors in for your people. Yes um, a Question <laughs> well do, do you feel the same? Do you say? Do you think there is a there's that's the beginning of a movement, or do, is it still a, a hard sell for people to say like, hey, your people should have a mentor, not only a manager? There's a definite movement on the people who desire to be mentored, um, person, um, formal and informal. Um, businesses aren't yet ready to see the benefit of it. Um, they they're. And I come from a research background, so I've been looking at, you know, a lot of data, and um, it's it helps. So, particularly when it comes to junior developers, everybody wants a senior developer, but every senior developer has a job that they want, and it's like you need to be able to bring in these juniors. Okay, so if it's going to take me a while to bring them up to speed so they're pro um, pro um, productive on the team, how do I best do that? And mentoring is a great model for doing that. It's not the only model, but it's a really great model. And what that does is not only... Does it help um, bring in the the junior or the new person to the team and helps them acclimate to the culture of the organization, helps you pass on information, but during mentoring that doesn't help in, let's say, a training program. Training programs have a strict outline, they follow this thing, and then maybe you test something. When you're mentoring, there are a lot of un unknown things or unwritten things that the senior will know and be able to tell or be able to identify by working with someone that don't come up in training. Um, so mentoring is a great um, a strategy for helping to acclimate people to culture, getting juniors um, j ready. Because most juniors, if you're coming out of boot camp or doing an online class, as I said in my thing, 69% of people are self-taught. How do they learn a about real development? How do they learn how to um, quickly and efficiently put up a dev environment in your organization? How do they learn how to communicate um, bug fixes or all these other things or these un unknown things about culture in your organization. Those things come from mentoring. So again, it doesn't have to be formal. It can be informal. But formal mentoring allows for, as I was speaking and talking about in my uh, presentation, allows for um, the leadership to put in benchmarks. Because if it's not demonstrable, if it's not measurable, then people don't, m mentoring is really, it's not tangible. It's just thing. That's the prejudice about it, isn't it? Like we, 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 we okay, we put mentors in place, we, agree, we assign people to mentors or we let them find them. And hopefully we find some talent in the person that we didn't know, which is a great outcome mm -hmm. from mentoring that I find. But uh, to the then it's like, okay, how do we measure that? Like if the engineer has been on a client case for like 16 hours, we can get money for that. Mm -hmm. If the engineer, the junior engineer has been spending three hours with a mentor in the last month, what came out of that and what's the long-term goal? And those are the intangibles that when you're, t when people are thinking about business outcomes, it can't just be dollars and cents because, well, it comes down to dollars and cents, but it can't be immediate dollars and cents. When you acclimated someone to your culture through mentoring, because it's a re mentoring is, is done in relationships, people are less likely to leave your, your companies, which is reduces turnover and reduces then the HR process of training, recruiting, that whole thing. So that's one measurable uh, um, return on investment. Um, it also helps 
in a mentoring environment, again, with the relationship, when mentor, mentees feel safe to make mistakes, they're more, they're quickly go ask for help instead of sitting there all day, beating their heads up and afraid to ask for help for something. And they've wasted hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then a mentor can say, OK, these kind of problems I need you to figure out on your own. These kind of problems, if, if you've worked on it for 30 minutes, an hour, you're still not getting anywhere. Those are the kind of problems you need to bring to the team so we can brainstorm that kind of thing. No one learns that on their own. That's something that only somebody who's in the culture can understand those things. And then that is a uh, product of the RRI because now I'm not wasting five hours on something when I could have been being more productive. Mm -hmm. An interesting one is also that like the best talent that I always managed to manage to get was word of mouth with talent that I already hired. So somebody who feels uh, appreciated in a company yes. by having a mentor program is more likely to talk to their very talented friends to come and into then as well. You don't have to pay for recruiting fees and all these other things. And you don't you don't get the uh, uh, the professional developers that are professionally asking for perks rather than asking for staying in a company exactly. for a few years. Exactly. Exactly. An interesting one though is, and I've been. I just talk, was uh, invited to talk on a panel about diversity and uh, in our market, and I, I pointed out the biggest problem is that uh, we're in this uh, hype world where we're like the investment bankers of the 80s now. Like everybody has to deliver 100%, everybody needs to be a rock star mm -hmm. developer, everyone else needs a 10 times developer, mm -hmm. whatever that is. And uh, uh, the, average, we, uh, the average assumption is that people stay in a company for one tops two years. And I find this ridiculous because that means our market is not maintainable or exactly. or, or, or actually future facing at all. All we do is uh, is burn out people and it's, discard them. Yeah, and that that is not is not an efficient and effective model, particularly when every day somebody has a great idea and wants to do some kind of some company that touches tech some kind of way, and so there are developers that need that will be needed for that. So it's like this increasing need for people to be in these jobs in these positions as developers. And you can't, they can't burn out. I mean, this is not, this is not social, this is not social work. This is not education where teachers burn out on. This is a well-paying job where I should be able to, as an organization, you should be able to come up with strategies so that everybody benefits. And it's not just about money. And a lot of it is about culture. Um, and if people are lead, I mean, there will be people who are just jumping for money, but that's not the majority of people. Most people want to be in an environment with, which, which, sustains them is is in and this is not about being a socialist or you know govern it's not, it's not even politics people just want a quality of life and when people feel that the organizations they're with care about them they are um are more able to to be involved anyway and i just read this research study and i don't have the documentation right now but it was about um because my, my doctoral study is about um, strategies that su successful software engineers use to mentor junior software engineers. And one of the areas I'm looking at is disengagement or p employees that are not engaged. They cause more um, cost to the business than an effective mentoring program because they're taking unpaid, I mean, they're taking sick leave, unpaid time off. They don't, I mean, they're not engaged. They're on the jobs and they're really not doing anything. And the, the, the data was that $11 billion a year is spent with turnover on these employees. What if you, what if they had a mentor and got engaged in your company and felt that they belong, that their, their, their contribution mattered? Again, it's not 100%. Everybody's, it's not going to work for everybody because there's some people, somebody tells them, you know, $1,000 more, they're going to leave. But the majority of people want to be engaged. That goes back to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. People want to be feel they, they they matter and their work matters. And when you bring in new talent, I don't and, and again, let me. It's not just young people. People of various ages are coming to this. When someone comes to you and they've had 20 years of experience in corporate America or something doing something. That's a trade-off. That's a barter. You're not getting a junior. You're getting somebody who doesn't might not understand cold well and needs help with that. But they have some skills that can really help your business, and that's how people need to be looking at it. Hmm. Would you agree that that the, if we focused more on these kind of social interactions and to build a more uh, um, supporting environment, that uh, more diversity would be a normal outcome of that? Uh, um, and it has to be intentional. Yes. Because um, one of the things I, when people um, talk about underrepresented and bringing in women and people of color, you have to, first of all, be in these communities. You have, they have to see themselves as being able to do this. Um, 
most people um, in my life are amazed by what I'm doing. And I'm not, I don't consider myself a developer. I found my niche where I can speak tech to non-techies. I can be in that middle space. But most people see themselves as only consumers. That's the majority of people. And what, if you, so the people that I find often are the people, oh, I had a Commodore, C, you know, those, they're, but that's, we need more people than that. So we need to expose more people, just come into their communities and talk about what code is. And then once people say, oh, that's what that is, that's one reason that computational thinking to me is very important. Because if I can ex share with someone, okay, this is what computational thinking is. Um, let's say you go into a grocery store and you pick up an apple. That apple's a variable. They just gave it the name apple. You have a cart. It's an object. You're putting things in your cart. That's an object. You're going around. That's a loop. You know, just really basic stuff and compare, letting people see it's not that far and these are things you're doing every day. People are like, oh, I think I can. Yeah, this, this matters to me. But when you look at the majority of communities, most, I didn't grow up with a computer. You know, majority of us don't grow up in computers. Um, only reason I decided to get into this was because I knew I had an affinity for tech that was beyond just being a consumer, was really interested in it. Um, and a lot of people would, but they don't. I didn't see myself as a as a producer. I didn't see myself as it being a job. It was just something that I was interested in. It could maybe be a hobby. It's interesting that prejudice both goes both ways. I'm working with uh, All Star Code in New York right now mm -hmm. that goes to Latino and black communities and goes to high schools and also other schools directly talking to kids about uh, careers in IT, what is mm -hmm. a possibility. And there is a lot of animosity of people that go into the program from their friends who see like a career in sports a much more obvious choice. Yes. So there's a lot of like, well, well why are you hanging out with those guys? It's mm -hmm. not at all our crowd. So it's kind of weird that the, the, that the that prejudice this in communities or in in the culture brought up this tribalism that actually ha forces us to find ways find people in between that can communicate between these different levels as well yeah. and it's a it's an uphill battle but i find it incredibly exciting because yeah. i can just see the immense potential of somebody with a background like that who doesn't uh, uh, grow into a consuming computer society but actually wants to see it as a maker as something that they haven't done before there's lots of potential that way and that's another reason i'm working with um some people on the spectrum i have a group that we, i call it um the spectrum codes because some, um, there are a few uh, Fortune 500 companies like SAP that has an um, uh, initiative that 1% of their developers will be on the spectrum. Ours as well, yeah. Yeah, okay. And yeah. so, um, I, because I'm a certified special needs teacher, it always frustrated me to have students who could have a good benefit from these kind of jobs. But because social services, the p people they go to for help don't understand these things, they're not guided into this. They're stacking groceries, you know, that kind of thing. And so one of the things I'm doing, I have four um, individuals now who are on the spectrum. And they're, we're uh, working with getting them coding skills and also um, helping them um, with their social skills and hopefully being able to um, have a conversations with potential employers about how to you interview someone like this. You can't shoot questions off at a person like this. Um, I was talking to Eric, who's who spoke today and who's here, um, who's a closure guy. And he, we had lunch today and I was saying um, the, a, a, a interview would be different for them is instead of bringing them in the one shot, bring them in a few times, have them just sit with some developers, pass them a, um, a, some kind of, hey, I'm having this problem. What do you think about that? That's a different way of interviewing them. And and I don't think it's, it should be a different way to interview any newbie. Giving people whiteboard tests and all that, it's kind of stressful. <laughs> and so it it's really also useless. It gives you the wrong talent. Exactly. You're it's, not solving problems. And that's what yeah. I tell people. You're hired as a developer to solve problems. And so this helps you demonstrate that, help them see where your levels your levels are. Again, coming from a, a education background, coming from a training background, if it's not measurable, it's really, it's really hard to do anything. I like to see. I like to demonstrate. You have to demonstrate to me. Don't tell me you know something. Demonstrate your knowledge. That is the biggest problem. I mean, I, I, when I'm coaching people and I'm using workshops, there's always quizzes at the end, not like a, a here's your final paper, yeah. but like I just want to know that people understood what I was mm -hmm. doing because otherwise I could fool myself into thinking yes. I've done a great workshop. Mm -hmm. And it feels fluffy, it feels warm, but it doesn't mean that I actually changed somebody or helped somebody with the course and they paid money for it, they're going to get and something out. Happening that I see in boot camps. 
Um, yeah. There's a lot of either they they go really wide with the breath where they cover everything, or they really go deep in a stack. But there's no opportunity to practice. There's no opportunity to make mistakes. There's no opportunity for collaboration. Those are not enough of that. So that when they're not in that environment where somebody's there to answer them, um, help them ask questions when they're by themselves and starting, they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. There's not enough practice. There's not enough. Th there's nothing measurable. Um, and, and one of the solutions I um, talk about is project-based learning. Again, coming from education, a project-based learning. So let's say you get someone some, comes to you and says, I want to learn development. Well, that's not measurable. So let's break this down into some measurable parts. So let, what are you talking about? So, oh, I like design. Okay, so if you like design, that leads me to thinking maybe UX, UI, what do we need? What kind of skills you need for that? Okay, so you definitely need HTML, CSS. So... As somebody who's never, maybe never even, don't even, doesn't even know what a variable is or whatever, first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with HTML. We're not even going to talk about how it works. The, I'm going to give you um, a document. Here are some tags. Let's start with just a few tags. Tag that up. Based on what I, the definitions of what I showed you or the um, examples you've seen, these tags. Now come back and explain to me why you put those tags on there. I used I used Word for that. I said like I, I said I'm loose the styling in Word, like paragraphs, mm -hmm. headings, and then use the tags accordingly. So you know you understand that you're structuring content here. You're not coding yet, but you're structuring content. That's the first step of doing it. Um, it's uh, what, what do you think about? Uh, I, I'm so I'm, I'm a massive uh, uh, open source guy, and Microsoft hired me from mm -hmm. a massive organiza organization to get into that space more as well. And I find it fascinating that you can use an open source project. And uh, uh, one of my favorite interview questions is like, when would you not fix a bug? And one of the best questions, there's several good answers mm -hmm. to that. And I think uh, one of them is these beginner bugs that when you find something in your project that is really easy to fix. And that is not crucial to fix mm -hmm. and would cost you like 12 seconds of your time. But instead, you flag it up as a beginner bug that goes into the project and people start fixing something and learning the structure of the project by fixing that one thing and already having a positive experience by putting something into exactly. the project. Exactly. And there's, op there's a good opportunity in open source to get people into our market well, that way. Um, we have a, I have a website called Junior Dev Mentoring. And so it is a Ruby project, a Rails project. And then I started a Slack channel for Junior Dev Mentoring. And so since I started the Slack channel, because I went to um, Great Wide Open last year, and that was the first experience I had of open source. And I was like, I really want to open source this project. Mm -hmm. And so um, in that time, in the year, now it's I, the team has moved it from my personal GitHub. It's on an organizational GitHub, and we have newbie, um, we have newbie um, issues, and we're looking for more because I, I agree with you, and I've been saying this that um, so um, hoodie was a great uh, opportunity for that, um, um, and some um, Charlotte who does my pool, first pull request. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're doing is now curating um, newbie friendly issues so that it gives mentors and mentees projects to work on together. Mm -hmm. So that if you pull one from Junior Dev Mentoring or you pull one from Hoodie or whatever, now this is a project you can work with somebody and it's tangible, it's measurable, and it's not um, that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I totally agree with you. There's some interesting concepts. I'm mentoring a few people right now, and my challenges that I find is like from top down, I get the input, but there is uh, in a large corporation, when you start putting a mentoring framework in there, uh, there's middle managers then that, that, that assign people with far too much work that they get time to actually uh, uh, benefit from the mentoring that they get because I mentor them on public speaking so I want them to, to try out new materials and write co write outlines and mm -hmm. these kind of things but they don't get the time for doing it and it's, uh, it, it's a very tough uh, place to uh, the larger the corporation it seems the more opportunities for people to work against you as a mentor and, and that goes back to again organizational culture yeah because if it's if it's um, um, and so going back to my research topic the theory that the or the lens that I'm looking at it through is learning or uh, learning organization which is an organization that that is a part of it, it it's it, it's it's about taking the knowledge and skills that we learn individually bringing them together as uh, and and what can we how can we innovate based on this how can we change based on this and those kind of organizations are better supported for mentoring 
Now, it doesn't mean that other organizations aren't, but that has to come from leadership. Leadership has to understand that mentoring is a relationship and it takes time. And if you value that, you will put in in, in um, space and time for, um, you, it's, it's, bottom line, it's not lip service. You can't say, oh, we want mentoring and then don't provide the resources for it. Mm-hmm. And that's just, it, it, if they want them to be better speakers, then provide them the time to, to, to practice those skills, mm-hmm. to be able to meet with their mentor and not make it an, a, a, an obstacle to mentoring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One big thing I find, especially in the in the startup space, is like we talk about uh, uh, non-social skills in companies, non-empathetic companies, and I find it fascinating how many companies get millions of dollars of uh, of investment to build products, and then they outsource their HR, or they pay their HR people so terribly that they have a churn of like two months in HR. And if the, these are the departments that I uh, uh, reach out to when things go wrong, and these are the friends that I should have, mm-hmm. and if these friends are strangers, or if these friends are people that I don't even have time to start a relationship with before they're gone again, do you think there is uh, there is ways that our market needs to change, and how we can make people understand the value of uh, of these kind of social parts of a company? Well, again, with everything. Um Not with everything, that's an ops, um, but with most things, it comes down to money. And one of the conversations I have had is how do you educate venture capitalists on the importance of making sure, because you just can't throw money at a problem because it's wasting your money. You want, you are, you're investing to get, to get a return on your investment. How can you create a situation where um, you get more bang for your buck because it, you require that these things are in order? You require you, the data. Why is your turnover so high? What's going on? Then if, if your turnover is so high, then you owe us some money back or something. I mean, there has to be accountability because when there isn't, um, and this goes back to the diversity issue. When there is an all white boys club and people just have money, there's some, there's some, it's just spending money. You know, you, why, why, I don't need to be empathetic. I have this money. I can do whatever I want to. This is my business. There are people, and there are people who have great business, um, great business ideas. But to be a leader takes time and cultivation, and that needs to be mentored. And so, just because you're a CEO of a company does not mean that you're 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 a leader, at all. Oh, or, or, or even a public speaker, or even a public figure. Exactly. And so, and you, and that does not make you a great manager. Hmm. Um, and so, HR and those soft skill. Um, um, departments that you're outsourcing because you don't see a need for them because they cost you money. Again, when I go back to what we talked about before, there are a lot of intangibles or what seem intangibles that are great for um, your return on investment. Because every time you lose somebody, that means you have to go through the process of vetting other people and that costs money. Hmm. I find the uh, I find it sometimes funny when you go in in your career and you become better. I I always hired people that are better than me technically because I want them to take over from me, mm-hmm. so I can do other things in the future. And I I moved far away from the what the developer that I used to be by being able to do other things like public speaking, like mentoring, mm-hmm. like sitting in meetings and saying like no, we cannot do this before we even start coding it mm-hmm. and wasting time on it. But there is a lot of like uh, pressure, peer pressure in the community itself that if you're not coding twenty four seven and then you're actually one of those sales guys we don't want to talk to. It reminded me of the punk scene. I used to be in a punk band and we then we got a bit successful and all of a sudden people didn't like us anymore because now you're like a sellout and you're like, yeah. well, yesterday you loved us. What's yeah. going on here? Yeah. So do you think there is a, a we, we, we have a problem that our community is just too young and too high schooly clickish to break that? Well, you can't blame it on them because this 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 industry has been around for years. So it's it's it's, it's you have it's about sixty years. It's not much. I mean, but you have the old guys who just don't want to change. Yeah. You have the young guys who are in a culture or in a, a, grew up in a generation where they could do no wrong. They show up. They they get a prize. Um, if there was ever, ever issue, their parents handled it for them. A lot of them don't have have very bad coping skills. They don't understand how mistakes, you know, how to come back from mistakes or failures. Um, And so that, when you talk about diversity, when you talk about bringing women in, when you're talking about bringing cultures in who have already experienced or daily basis experience these kind of things, it's a challenge for them to come in there and feel safe. Um, But it can be done, but it comes from your, you have to have a desire to be a better mentor, to be a better leader, to be a better manager, and 
being able and because one of the things I talk about in my um, presentation, self assessment is key. Because if you don't assess or you have a false identity or false sense of how great you are, when no one around you is able to tell you, hey, dude, this is not working, yeah. then that cycle continues. So um, then you, I mean, it's, it's, that's why I like the space that I'm in because I'm not connected to anybody. So I can just be honest. This is what I see. So yesterday, someone here at the conference um, came up to me and said, oh, um, Th thank you for your talk on mentoring. Are there any online things about for that my team could use for mentoring? And so that's what people's first thing, because everything needs to be online. Everything needs to be web-based. And so I was like, so tell me more about your problem. And I was like, I mean, I could come in and do something very specific to your needs. But as I'm talking to him, it's you're in, as, and this is things that HR would, would have identified. You don't have a mentoring problem. What you have is a, as, a, as, a, as a leader, who is not empathetic and is rude and is a butthole to people. That's what that is. <laughs> and so I don't care how much mentoring you do, it's not going to work. So it's the, the fish thing that thinks from the head. Exactly. And that's where culture comes. Culture comes from the head. Yeah. So would you say that something like affirmative action is something uh, that, that can or is necessary to force change in a shorter way, that you get people in higher positions from more diverse backgrounds rather than like trying to make your workforce uh, more diverse from the ground up. The the thing with um, affirmative action, okay, that's a political thing, and there are there it, it's proven. In I am I'm African American. <laughs> um, really? Yeah, and and I'm going to be honest. Being black and female in tech has been a win for me. I mean, I, <laughs> I can check off two boxes: underrepresented in two things. So I, I I mean, it works for me. But the reason and 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 I say this because. Affirmative action is it becomes very politicized. You know, you're discriminating against us. What it does is no, not many people who um, benefited from affirmative action did not have to go in and bust their butts twice as hard as the next man to get to the next level. So it's not like they're coming in and not doing anything, mm -hmm. but it gives them, a, it opens the door. Mm -hmm. if, and it also forces you not to close the door on them. Yeah. Um, so once given the opportunity, um, but again, even that's a political thing. Why, why should I force you as a business owner or organization leaders when, when it is proven that for you to create products for everybody, you don't have my perspective. You cannot create yeah. great products for feminine hygiene. I'm sorry. It's just I not seriously, I seriously <laughs> like the, uh, the internal training that we have on diversity is not about like, here's not what to do. And mm -hmm. here's how people are different from mm -hmm. you. Like others are that I had to encounter before, but ours was basically showing a product that failed and then how the product team became more diverse and redesigned it with mm -hmm. different needs for different people and made it a success that way. Yes. And I think that is a much more beautiful story exactly. to tell and exactly reality story to tell. It fascinates me that products like Pinterest are 90 percent women and the most of the engineering team is men again mm -hmm. on that or let's not get into politics what's happening yeah. right now here but the people who make laws against about female issues basically none of them being women is just ridiculous mm -hmm. but um it, it's what i found uh, dis disheartening though and that might just be me from the outside trying to do too much at the right time is that uh, i've got lots of mentees that are basically uh, women speakers and then they get invited to conferences and their first reaction a uh, gut reaction is like they invited me because i'm a woman not because i'm a speaker that is interesting to them mm -hmm. so that is a real concern that like as a man you never have kind of thing so it's it, it, it's 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 a real problem that in society it's like it seems like there's a rooted problem that like he only asked me because of this and that and not like hey cool i got asked i'm doing it yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. how can we make this attitude different and that was some because i also do a speaker series for uh for our atlanta women who code um um group and there was some conversations they talked about do you want to be would you rather um be brought in as a, you know, because you're a woman or because of a great topic. I guess I'm going to go from affirmative action. I want to get in mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not speaking for anything else. So I appreciate being black and female because again, I check off two boxes. And so when I get in, people are like, oh, she can really, her presentations are really good. Oh, I mean, this, that, and the other. So you so, let your action speak against yes, the prejudice, so to say. That, and that's how people have been doing affirmative action for years. Yeah. Just let me in the door. 
Trust me, I'll knock the doors off. <laughs> I had the same with like people were like, "Oh, I'm not gonna go to a conference where that speaker is speaking because I don't agree with what he's saying." And I'm like, "Actually, I want to be there. I want to be the next speaker to counteract some mm -hmm. of the things that that person has been saying instead of just letting that thing go mm -hmm. and like him having the audience and nobody bringing the counterpart mm -hmm. of it." Mm -hmm. So there is opportunities for uh, for people out there, uh, but by just saying like, you know what? It doesn't matter why I was invited, but I'm going to make a great job yes. out of it. And then next time I get invited because I'm me and not because I'm that person. And I'm just, I'm just, I tell people, I am, if, if you don't get anything else from me, I am the walking embodiment of what it meant two years ago to make a decision to change my, comp I mean, I left my career. I did not know much about tech except for the things that I enjoyed. Started speaking just last year and um, spoke at my first perfect, my first conference was at Scotland JS and so much positive feedback start, it started this ball rolling and that was just June it hasn't even been a year yet and so it's possible it's when you get in there and you have to have to show them you know I don't have to tell you and that's my whole, I don't have to tell you anything I want to again it goes back to demonstration I'm going to demonstrate to you my level of knowledge I don't have to tell you anything well, we just did, so <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you. It was you. great. Cool.